you know, like I think, I think a lot about queer people being archived and who's archiving us and like the role of the archiver. Do you want me to? <laughs> this is one of my early achievements. Is it? What? In 78, creating this adventure playground. <laughs> <laughs> I admit it, I just love London. I do, and I love it here. I love it here. Tell mm. me five things that you like about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh my god. Because <laughs> <laughs> I five. love it. Oh, well, go on, let's start, let's start with five. places where like little factories right. and they are little Dickensia like that doorway isn't amazing it? it's amazing so I love growing up in these in these little flats of course you're spending the whole time thinking how can I get out of here <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have a playground I wish we'd had that this so the first plays I ever performed were they comedies were they dramas was it I can't play? remember oh, there okay. would be I Exactly what I do now. Now I write plays. Yeah. Well, the way I, my process is, I cast it first. I make a team of people. Oh yeah. And then I write the scripts for them. Brilliant. So all the films you've seen of mine or anything, it was like yeah, bit, yeah. cast yeah. it first, wrote it for them. And I started that process when I was about seven or eight. I would write my plays. I lived in that flat there. I would perform my plays down here. So my first stage was this and I would get the other kids to sit all up the stairs and they'd all be squashed on the stairs. Oh, fantastic. And they'd watch a play we'd do. And you would use that for entrances and exits. <laughs> and that's Very where we would do our plays. It's got a sense of sort of Shakespeare for yeah, some reason. Yeah, it's even got that, yeah. And then, so that was my first stage. Fantastic. Would you consider yourself a storyteller? And what do you think stories are for? Uh, well, we're all storytellers. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important, you know, kids grow up loving stories. It's, they say it's like the second or third word that children learn. They learn mummy. I think they learn daddy first because it's easy to say mm -hmm. in English. And, um, and mummy sometimes second. But the, wor the first word they learn besides that is story. Mm. So story, story. They want their parents to tell them stories. I know when I grew up, I was craving my mother to tell me in bedtime stories. Mm. And so it's all about stories. When you dress, you're telling a story. When you write your CV, you're telling a story. Mm. When you're... Um, Everything about you is, is, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, this is what I've been through, don't mess with me or pity me or uh, help me or whatever it is you're saying. The whole basis of my company has been everybody has a face worth seeing, everybody has a voice worth hearing, everyone has a story worth telling. I feel like I started off on the right path yeah. and then I think when I was about 18, 19, I had an amazing journey in my career but once I left school at 15 and I started to try and get into the business, all there were lots of messages telling me to deviate from who I was. There were lots of people saying, you can't do everything, you can't write, direct and do the music and design and be in it. Loads and loads of people were trying to dissuade me from that, because saying that there'd be a loss in quality, there'd be a loss in, um, in, in credibility, that it was being greedy, and, um, and also the things of, trying to be uh, more conventionally masculine, trying to be more conventionally European, or trying to be more conventionally, you know, black. And there were people within those institutions who were like, be yourself, but mostly the messages are, that won't work. And it's take, it took me a, a little while to come back to, I, I was right when I was five, six, seven, when I was a kid and I, seven, I started to write plays and, and, you know, the kid who was three wanted to be a writer, the kid who was seven, he wanted to be a playwright, the kid who was 11, who went, I'm going to direct my friends in shows, was the one who had it right. Yeah. And the one that was going, like, how do I, how, I, how can I look more acceptable on, in my headshot? That was the wrong version of yeah. me. So you start fully formed, and then there's all this distraction, and, um, and it's healthy for you to, to take that in. But it's not the journey, that's not where, that's not where my power lay. 
So it's been That's a nice. fantastic thing to learn. Mm -hmm. And you know, because you're told you're too gay, you're too this, you're too yeah. that. And of course, you're not too anything except too scared. Ah, wonderful. That's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, I feel yeah. very lucky. Because of the education or because of the, the architect? Yeah, everything, everything. Beautiful place to study. Yeah. Great people. And I think one of the best things about this college is you're allowed all over the grass. What is it that you love about the outside and in nature and that. Outside is my happy place. Um, <laughs> I, I love nature, mm. I love being a part of it. Sometimes you feel like you're sort of being held by it. At other times it feels like you're just sort of getting boshed along by it, you know, mm. if it's stormy or, or whatever. And it's all those different things. It's interesting, it's fun, it teaches you about yourself, it gives you space, it calms you down, it gets you excited, it heals things. It's kind of so many things to me. But wow. Wow. I think at the root of it, it's sort of just essential. It is about an what essence do you mean or something. Well, like you need it. I think without, without time and space outside, I just, I couldn't be. Couldn't and I had be. a, I, I just couldn't be. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And yeah. last year I had a, a breakdown, like full on breakdown. I was ready to drive into trees and eyeing up the knife block and things. You know, just at my absolute lowest ebb. And to spend time outside to be in the garden, even if it was just standing in the garden, just feeling the grass beneath my feet and the sort of the sun on my face, or whether it was picking some fruit that had grown or, or chopping something or whatever it was, it just, it was healing. Part mm. of that was, was healing. I think it grounds you in the here and the now as well. Mm. I think that's like really important. Like a mindful important. meditation? I think so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think okay, so. Okay, cool. Mm. Yeah, you feel the warmth. Isn't it lush? Yeah. Isn't it lush? What's important, is it the process or the outcome or is it 50-50 for you? I think it's ultimately all about process right. and about the journey. There is a, there's a proverb that I've always had on my boats when yes. I've been out rowing. Um, the journey is the reward. And Lovely. it's almost regardless of where you end up, what the outcome is. Yes. Hopefully, if yes. you've got that mindset, then you're gonna come away having um, sort of felt fulfilled or learnt something from it. Or, yeah. You know, you're, you're going to have experience and hopefully richness and things. You are, which, not hopefully, you are. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And so my, um, the London to London via the world journey, I was picked up off the Atlantic, which was kind of the penultimate stage. Mm. I was picked up off the Atlantic before a hurricane came. Mm. I was about 600 miles from making land. Mm. And so some people sort of said, oh, are you going to go back and do it again? Mm. And was, that, was that a hard decision not to go back and do it again? Yeah, I'm I like, wanted that. No, because mm. we fulfilled all the objectives. You right, know, if right. we go, come home safely, have a huge adventure, inspire kids on the way, if they're the sort of the named goals, uh, we'd, we'd done all that in bucket loads. Yeah. So I didn't feel I needed to. So that's, yeah. I think that's a really good example that it's not about the outcome. It's about what has happened on the way. A lot of the things that have happened to me in my life where stuff hasn't gone to plan. Yeah. Actually, I look back on it and something really cool has come out of it, whether it's a lesson, whether it's meeting someone, meet it, or kind of just really rich, interesting experiences or yeah. deeper kind of insight or understanding into something or to myself. That's fabulous. So a lot of, yeah, it feels like lots of things. I've had lots of ups and downs in my life, but I kind of um, have learnt to even if it's retrospectively, yeah. sort of embrace those, those downs or yeah. the bits where it hasn't gone to plan. Well, I've never seen that before. You yeah, I know. No. Uh, so I'm up here uh, on there and um, we're really brilliant and so brilliant on our team. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. How could we? So brilliant. <laughs> it sounds like you were having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get your sort of passion for the stuff that you do? Probably that's a question for the psychiatrist's couch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say that, you know, look, looking back at my past, I grew up in a very devoutly, quite extreme Christian fundamentalist family. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very similar to 
Oranges are not the only fruit. I love that. You know, the Jeanette Winterson book. Yeah, that was brilliant. Her family depicted there is very, very similar to mine. Dude. So quite extreme, quite extreme. Yeah. But on the good side, they did give this sense of, you know, the importance of doing what is right. Okay. That they, they saw that in religious terms, you know, do what the Christian calling requires. Don't follow the mob. Don't just go along with the crowd. Stand up for what you believe to be right. And of course, I translated that into a wider, you know, social political context as Brilliant. well. Brilliant. So for me, um, from an early age, I was very questioning and skeptical. Um, very one to not just go along with what everybody else said. Was that innate in you, that questioning, or did you have like an inspiration from a teacher, or no. you just like, it was I, I don't your way being? I don't know where it came from. Okay, okay. That's I different. suppose I took elements of Christianity and sort of adapted them. So, mm -hmm. you know, the good Samaritan. Yes. You know, yes. I am my brother and sister's keeper. Yes. Um, yes. You know, those basic precepts of love thy neighbour as thyself, those are rooted in Christianity yeah. in, in my upbringing, yeah. but also, of course, shared by other faiths and people of no faith. Yes, absolutely. So it's absolutely. rooted in humanism as well. So my question to you, Peter, is what is love to you? I think love is probably partly about sharing mm. and partly about the basic idea of treating others as you would have them treat you. Mm. If you operate in that way, you are giving an expression to love. And then, of course, as well as that being on a personal level to a partner or family or friends, it can also translate politically and socially to a movement for social change to end injustice. Mm -hmm. Love is, to me, the single most important anchor mm. in all my human rights work. Yeah. If I look back over my, what, nearly 50 years of activism, I can't uh, remember any single action I've ever done that I've been uh, totally satisfied with. Uh. You know, I've always thought, oh, I wish I'd done this or yeah. I should have done that. Yeah. And I am very, very hyper self-critical. I often have post-action depression oh. um, because I just think it could have been done better or mm. that, that things could have been done differently. Mm. Um, I said so that's sort of quite destructive in a way, but on the upside, it's always kept me very on my toes. Uh. So I've never felt sort of smug and self-satisfied because yeah. I've always been thinking well it could have been better or I must do it differently next time and that's helped improve and strengthen and develop my activism Wonderful. because I haven't sat back and been complacent yeah. and I do listen to my critics you know some of them are quite harsh and some of them say some pretty horrible things but uh. I think it's important to listen to your critics uh. because sometimes what they say is right and sometimes if you listen you can learn. Uh. Sometimes your critics can help you improve and be better in, in, in the ideas you espouse and the way you do it. Uh. I'm going to shine like Clara Bow. I'm going to shine like Jean Harlow. I'm going to shine like Marilyn Monroe. I won't walk scared, my head hung low. I'll toss my hair like Brigitte Bardot. Wink at people I don't know. They'll think she shines like Clara Bow. Don't need to ask what my life is for when I can shine like Dorothy Lamour. I'm not in films or on the telly, but I'll still shine like Grace Kelly. I want my light to blaze and burn while I can shine like Audrey Hepburn and heads will turn wherever I go to see me shine 
like Clara Bow. I don't have wealth, and I don't need fame, and I won't heed the ageist game. Years won't make me hide in shame, I'll shine on brightly all the same. We're now enlightened women, so let's vow to shine like Clara Bow. Love eludes me, life is tough, but I'm a woman and that's enough. No one knows the things I've done, that I'm as good as anyone. I'm a star, so are you all. Every woman, please walk tall. Sway those hips and pout those lips. Take a tip from Lauren Bacall. Put them together, wish, then blow. And shine, shine, shine like Clara Bow. I will sway my hips. I will paint my lips. I'm a woman to my fingertips. It took long years for me to find a life, a body to match my mind. And I should treasure whatever time I've left to spend with womankind. Yes, it took far too long for me to find this life, this body, to match this mind. And I swear to treasure whatever time I'm spared to share with womankind. So, before I have to go, to leave this woman's world behind, I want the whole world to know, I'm going to shine, I'm going to shine, I'm going to shine, shine, shine and blind. I love Afrofuturism. Well, it's kind of like sci-fi, but a black practice of sci-fi. So Octavia Butler, like loads of people writing about what it would be like to be in a future where black people weren't oppressed. Yeah. But in Afrofuturism, they also talk a lot about gender in that. And it's interesting because when we look back at the past, yeah. pre-colonial history, we did have more than one gender. When you look at like pre-colonial Africa, there was lots of existence of people with multiple genders. They recognized third genders. The same in India and South Asia, there was the hijra and third genders. And it was actually, people, it's really interesting when people say, oh, this new thing, yeah. non-binary, whereas yeah. actually it's one of the oldest things that yeah. we have. Yeah, and I love that. I think that's so wonderful to sort of reclaim that history yeah. and actually kind of build on that and take us, take us forward rather than this restrictive one or the other yeah, binary. Yeah, definitely. And I also think it's kind of liberating for like, heterosexual men as well. I think about this a lot. I think that I have few heterosexual friends, <laughs> but the, the ones I do, through my trans identity becoming bolder, through me being more vocal about my transness, they've actually explored a lot of gender themselves. Yes. And I think everyone benefits from yes. trans people in society. Yes. Everyone yes. benefits from thinking about their gender. Um, I'm really bored of... I'm really bored of people thinking that gender and transness is only an issue for trans people to yes. talk about. I yes. think it's something that everyone will learn about. And, and benefit. Grow, and benefit yeah, from as well. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, like, it's like the whole gay liberation thing from like, like the 60s and 70s. It's like everyone benefited yeah. from that. Yeah. It's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. What happens when you're performing work as a person that holds the multiple identities that I do mm. is that it becomes also not just about your work, but also you become this um, 
beacon of someone, you know, there's so few black trans people in the UK making work at a visible level mm. that when they start seeing a black trans person at the tape or, you know, on these big stages or selling out shows or opening for things, people that are young and queer that want that representation obviously place a certain oh my god on yeah. you, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. for me, managing those expectations means that I want to still give them a part of me. I want to, you know, if someone comes up to me and says, I really love your work and I spent money to come and see you, you want to give them time. Yeah. But also, a lot of the times after I perform, it might be like my fifth gig that week and I'm fucking knackered. Yeah. So it's managing how much to be like, I'm so tired, I want to leave. Yeah. And also managing, no, I want to go out and say hi. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a constant thing because, you know, you don't want to meet someone and they're just like half asleep whilst you're talking to them. Yeah. But if I think that's when the element of performance after the show comes in. OK. Because if I was my actual self after I performed, yeah. I'd be collapsing on a bed with a cigarette in my yeah. hand. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or I'd be running off with my friends who, like, don't, we don't talk about any of my work with my friends, or yeah. we don't talk about any of that. We just, like, you know... Hang out together. Hang out together. Watch TV. Yeah. Really, when, why I work is for therapy. Like, a lot of my work is just free therapy for me. <laughs> and I say this a lot to people. I don't actually create work. I've been saying this more and more recently to drive at home. Like, my goal when I create work isn't to inspire other people. It's actually not for other people. Yeah. I create work very self centeredly for me. And then as a byproduct, I think that makes authentic work yes. that connects with other people. I totally agree with you. I totally agree. I mean, a lot of artists say that, don't they? So it's sort of write what you know or film what yeah. you know, let it come from your core. Yeah. And then that's the universal human experience. Right. And I think if I focus so much when I write down about, oh, this needs to be about trans people of colour, this needs to be about this, then I would make work that was stale. Yeah. And I think, really, I'm just writing... We can talk about the work as this identity thing that's about trans people of colour, it's about liberation, but actually, when you look back at the core of the work, <clears throat> it's just about, like, being loved, care and violence and trying not to have violence against me, and I think those things go beyond an identity. Yeah. So, love. What does that mean to you? <laughs> um, I think about love in not terms of like romantic. Yeah. I try not to differentiate between friends and romance. I think my yeah. friendships are really romantic. I think I love my friendships because they're really romantic. I think that's why we do this work. I think that's why we do activism. I think that's why we look at social justice. It's searching for a world that will love us equally, right? And at the moment, some people in the world are loved by more other people easier, right? Because I don't just think love is like romance and friendship and that ooh feeling. I also think love can take like really material positions as in like, do you have a house? Like, are you loved by the state? Like, what does that mean to be loved by, like loved by the country you're in? You know, like I think in the UK, like some people are looked after and cared for and some people aren't. Yeah. Oh, they're waving back. <laughs> Pretty much the most important thing that we need now is to change the story, to actually change the narrative, almost like the paradigm that people are living in. We conflate wealth with morality. <laughs> you know, rich, good, yeah. poor, bad. Yeah, it's true. Um, and almost the, the very idea of sharing and cooperation has, has almost become a sort of anathema. You know, it's, it's either hopelessly naive on the one hand um, or outright dangerous on the, on the other hand. Why dangerous? <clears throat> well, the idea that it's somehow sharing some sort of more socially democratic system would somehow strip people of their liberty. Oh, OK. Um, rather than give them the liberty to make the maximum contribution that they were capable of as a human being, yeah, yeah. which obviously in our personal lives, most of us know that the things that have really caused us advances have been when people have shared their knowledge, shared their skills, you know, shared their compassion and empathy with us when we've been at low ebb. Yeah. Um, given us an opportunity which otherwise wouldn't have presented itself. Yeah, yeah. You know, and also shared wealth as well, you know, hard cash as well. Completely, you know, even down to our parents who shared their wealth, the fact that they helped, you know, brought us up in their home. Yeah. You know, we benefit from the sharing of the previous generations who built the welfare state. Yeah. You know, we were treated for illnesses and injuries as children. The roads work. You know, yeah, the yeah, police yeah. force is there if we're in need of help. You know, all of these institutions that were built around us, 
you know, so there really is no such thing as a self-made human being. You know, we're all a contrib you know, we're almost the sum total of all of the contributions yes. and experiences yeah. to our existence from people today and people in the past. So to say, you know, I did this on my own in a world which has been built before you arrived mm. is a bit rich. Yeah. Right, you know? <laughs> and it also excludes you, I think, from feeling part of something. Yeah. I think it's quite a lonely place to stand to have that worldview. You know, if you really think you do this stuff on your own, well, what about your parents? What about your friends? What about, yeah, you know, yeah. you know, none of those people have made any impact on you. I, yeah. I mean, it would be, a, you know, it would be a silly assertion to make. Jesse, come on! Everyone needs a hug. Everyone needs a hug. Oh, love, love it. <laughs> The thing that's really distinguished humanity, actually, if you really look at things, is cooperation. Mm. You know, how did we build cathedrals? How did, you know, all of this stuff, it mm. was essentially cooperation. And actually, that's all over nature, mm. um, that kind of cooperative attitude. It's every bit as natural to cooperate and make great things as it is to compete and kill each other and do that stuff. So how about, you know, we build a world and all of the institutions in it that foster that cooperation and the better angels of our nature that's you know, nice than, than the lesser nice angels of our nature. Yeah. Because I believe, and I think a lot of people recognise, that, that life, emotions are basically seen to be split into two. Yeah. Between love and fear. You yeah. either act from a place of fear or you act from a place of love. And yeah. love being... Um, <laughs> I, I don't know where she's operating from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So for me, it's not a conversation about if we move on from capitalism. We absolutely will. You know, if you've probably got an iPhone or, or a phone in your pocket. I've got a phone, don't have iPhones. You have a phone and, you know, <laughs> the cameraman has a phone and I have a phone. Um, and if someone said to me, oh, that phone in your pocket is, that's it for phones. Mm. There's never going to be yeah. any other developments in phone technology Ever. Yeah. That's it, it's the best we can do. You would obviously, we would laugh at the, you would go, that's absurd. There's probably right now a new type of phone that's sitting somewhere. People are capable of thinking up new ideas. Yeah. And that's a given. But when we look at kind of socioeconomics yeah. and we look at capitalism or the way our education system works or health, suddenly people become philistines and go, mm. nope, this is it. Mm. Nope, not willing to entertain a conversation for anything else. Mm. It's like, how strange is that? that? On the one hand, we pride, you know, that the idea of progress is, is a pr matter of pride and insp inspiration. Yeah. But when we're talking about socioeconomics, often for people who have some investment in the system, it's a really threatening conversation to have. Mm. So you're um, a psychotherapist specialising in sex therapy and relationship counselling? Yeah, that's right. Um, what made you passionate about that? Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I feel like a lot of things that people are very unhappy about are in that area, mm. sex and relationships. Mm. Um, so I wanted to specialise in that. Um, and also, I guess the psychotherapy in a way was the thing that came last for me. I'd already studied psychology and again, what had fascinated me was sexuality and relationships um, and sort of emotions and mental health. Mm. So I was always kind of heading towards training as a therapist. Mm. But first of all, I studied it more academically and then I really wanted to actually work with people themselves directly. Uh, I see. Is, it, is there a difference between men and women or, you know, cis men and women with about in terms of, of what the issues are? Um, in terms of being able to talk about stuff. Oh yeah, I guess there's a kind of massive thing about how difficult it can be for men to open up in general about emotions because they're pretty much taught not to. Yeah. Um, although I think, you know, women are quite taught like that, that relationships are a big area that they're supposed to get right. Yes. So I think actually for, for, for anyone that can be just really hard to admit if you're struggling in a relationship. Um, and, and still a bit, like Simone de Beauvoir used to say, you know, women were kind of taught that their main point in life was to have a relationship. And although, you know, we're in a place of much greater gender equality, I think there's still an element of that, that that's like women's big adventure is love. 
a lot of people have been writing about how hard it is to sustain Excuse a relationship me. that's like a, it's supposed to be your best friend, it's supposed to be co-parent if you have kids, you're supposed to spend your everyday life together, you know, really, you know, you're supposed to be the person who looks after each other when you're ill, yeah. and you're also supposed to be this hot, passionate lover yeah. forever and ever with nobody else. Is you that know. too much to ask? Yes, <laughs> it is, it's way too much to ask of any one person is my, is my view. <laughs> so I think um, a lot of the research I've been involved with has found like the best thing is if people can have some separateness. So obviously I've studied people in non-monogamous relationships where they have other relationships as well or they have multiple relationships. But also even in a monogamous relationship, it seems like the people who do best have got some separateness, you know, in the, they, they do other things, yes. it's not, and they're not looking for everything in their partner. Right. Um, so they might have other people that they do a lot of the things they're enthusiastic about with, and that keeps it much more fresh, you know? Yeah. So I'll just bang into the lamppost. <laughs> So you would say you're well coordinated, would you? I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't claim that. <laughs> You wrote a book called Rewriting the Rules. That's right. I wanted to take every aspect of relationships and just take people through, like, what are the dominant messages? Why might you want to question them? But not a, it's not about saying you need to. It's like, if somebody's happy, if the rules work for them, brilliant. It's more about saying, here's some reasons why you might want to think about them. And after you've thought about them, you might decide, yep, this all works for me fine. Or you might decide, actually, I'd like to try something different. And then the book offers alternatives. So like with the monogamy chapter, it offers alternatives to monogamy. With the sex chapter, it offers alternative ways of doing sex and sexuality. So all the way through the book, there's like alternatives given. And then every chapter ends kind of by actually questioning Maybe what we don't want to do is replace the old rules with new rules. Maybe we want to question this whole concept of having rules about relationships and kind of get to somewhere a bit more flexible and fluid. And again, it's not saying you have to end up that, there, but it's asking the question of what would it look like if you did? Like, what would it look like if you were just, if you didn't, for example, classify relationships so clearly into who's my lover and who's my friend, but actually just treated people as people that you're connected with and just trying to be present with them, whoever they are in your life, without yeah. all of these rules about how you're supposed to do things. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. Um, it, but isn't there a sense of um, kind of, you know, when you're in an intimate relationship with a lover, yeah. you just reveal different sides of yourself and yeah. you feel safer with certain people? Well, I think so, but I suppose what I'm... And I'm, again, it's not about saying everyone needs to do this. No. It's about just opening up the possibility that if we're saying that one of the problems is we are looking for everything in one person. The problem with relationships when you do it like that is you can kind of grab hold of somebody and sort of insist that they stay the same and keep you safe. And actually that's often not very good for a relationship because that's where it can stagnate or you can end up resenting somebody. So, I mean, it's, it's existentially relationships are bloody hard. Um, and that's something I get into, into in the book. Instead of like this idea of a happy ever after, you know, let's admit how difficult it is to be intimate with another human being and how we're always drawn to want to belong, but we're also drawn to want to be free at the same time and be independent. And that push and pull is present in pretty much all our relationships. We travel, alive with sadness and passion, memories charging like stallions, kicking up the dust in our battered minds, filled with life, filled with death, fueled by pride. We travel alone with the memories of friends, absent but here, each soul still as queer as it was before, and although we stand baffled, we can't ignore the strength that helps shape our statements, emblazon sexuality, and insignia on fire as the most sacred of hearts. We travel hard like gypsies, tramps, and tarts, or soft as summer winds, warm, embracing, still chasing that elusive cure. We travel, not stagnant still like rancid water, 
We walk self-taught students of a life even broader than a muscle Mary's chest. Better than the rest. Much more colourful than the rainbow's faded divas sing about. We travel, we stomp and shout. There's no stopping us. We're on the move now. Soldiers of love and sex marching and mincing on, taking arms, linking up our shared experience. And with bangs bigger than nuclear bombs, the world will hear us as we travel forward. Doors of convention kicked open wide, taking life in our stride. We must not hide this depth of feeling, for we're not alone as we keep reeling. How can we say goodbye when memories are a constant reconciliation? So grab your thoughts and hold them close as the loved ones they've replaced and travel with joy, dignity and celebration. Don't take no for an answer. You will travel faster. Demand a better place. State your destination. But make it real. Because the yellow brick road was just a figment of somebody else's imagination. The journey of a million miles begins with a single step. And God, we've trod that path before. Distance promises twists and turns. Maybe the next corner might surprise. But real hope lies in strength and union. We've all something to say in a million ways of saying it. But even the biggest gob is louder when a thousand mouths cry. We're on the move now. With friends, lovers, bedfellows by our sides. We travel. These are our journeys. This is our life. I heard this radio interview that you did, sort of saying that you felt that you could uh, express different perspectives, like a, a ten-year-old Chinese girl or a, an old Jewish man. Or how? how? Um, it's funny. A, a friend of mine, he's he directs this great show I worked on called um, Noah's Ark, and um, and he t he said when he first met me. It was in an interview at MTV Films where he was working. And he said, it was hilarious because they said to me in the meeting, could you write this movie about uh, a 14-year-old white um, uh, anorexic high school girl? And I said, yeah, I am a 14-year-old white anorexic high school girl. <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and I said, well, I'm everybody. I'm everything. You know, I'm part of an organism the way that your toenail or your ear is part of the same organism. They're doing completely different jobs. They look completely different. If you took a photo of each one, you wouldn't necessarily think they had anything to do with each and the other. But neither is more important than the other. They are different functions, but they're feeding the same thing, which is this creature, this human, this, this organism, this, this evolutionary creature. Yeah. And, um, so I am part of an organism, so I am, a, a, I'm doing a different function, but I am a Chinese girl. I am all of these different people in the world. Just as Shakespeare is Juliet, he can write for Juliet, he can write for a king or a queen, he can write for someone evil, he can write Othello, he can write all these different characters that seem to have nothing to do with him, and he can get into their philosophy and say something profound because he understands that. He understands that they are all after the same thing, they're after the same things that all, all living things are after, sustenance, importance, significance, love, connection, survival, exploration, growth, um, and eventually change. That's what everybody is looking for, and they're all looking for it in specific ways. And if you 
So I like to look at the captains I do not understand, I do not get. I, I like mm. to look at people who are racist or people who are um, uh, uh, oppositional and attacking um, because th that's in me, somewhere in me. I've never taken a drug, so I love writing about drug taking. Right. I love writing about inebriation because Inebriation is something I consider myself above sometimes, but the minute I consider myself above inebriation, that's me getting inebriated on my own ego or yeah, my own... Yeah. No it's the same thing. Right. And so, so I can, can connect, connect it. with it. <laughs> yes, and, um, and then I know myself better, yeah, and hopefully yeah. I know other people better, yeah. and hopefully I can help each, us, each of us know ourselves better through one another and through... Um, uh, Empathy? Yes. Yes, and reflections of ourselves yeah. that aren't necessarily um, portraits of ourselves. Wow, that's beautiful. When you do some of the work that you do, yeah. with like Soldier and yeah. Fit, yeah. Uh, and you're dealing with quite confrontational um, topics, yeah. how do you not become overwhelmed by the subject matter and stay grounded and become become that channel and not go, like, retire to your bed for six weeks. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to feel overwhelmed by the work. Oh, I mean, right. I want to feel swept up in it. I want to feel like I'm in... I'm, uh, I want to feel like I'm in a tsunami and I'm surviving it. So I like that feeling of, oh, my God, this, I'm being lifted up off my feet. No, I can't touch the bottom. Is, will I find the bottom again? I like that sense of surfing, on the, that being part of a huge organism again. And being a little bit out of my depth. Never so far that you can't ever get back. Yeah. But I like that sense of, oh, I'm going to have to jump higher, I'm going to have to jump further, I'm going to have to dive deeper, I'm going to have to learn to hold my breath a little bit longer. I'm, this is like taking over my life, this is, uh, this is sweeping me away. I like that transformation. It's exhilaration. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> I, I'm always looking for that. I, I, right. I take at least one big project every year that I think I cannot do. I cannot do this many plays in two weeks. I cannot work with this many actors. I cannot organise all this. I cannot deliver this script on time. I cannot write all these songs. I cannot... Um, I, 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 I cannot... I cannot do this in all this time. I'd like to do that at least once a year. Something so big yeah. that I that I think uh, I, that as as I start to to you know step off that moment when you step off. I did a trapeze class, oh, yeah, and that yeah. moment when you have to let go and just <laughs> and you think, oh, what am I doing this? And the, uh, I, I, that is a great moment. Yeah. And then you land on the other side and. Yeah. And yeah, you might, you might be a bit bruised, your legs might be a bit chafed from being upside down on the trapeze, but you did it. Yeah. I, I love You hung that upside feeling. down on the trapeze, which you didn't do last week, yes. which is great. Yes. <laughs> now I'm someone new, I'm someone, yeah. I'm growing. Yeah, someone new, I like that. So where are we heading to now, Sarah? Let's go down to the river. The river! Leaving the dock? Tick. <laughs> Picking up the camera guy? Tick. tick. <laughs> Having hey. fun? Tick. tick. So when you were, you were at sea, how did you stay alert and like kind of present and not kind of just go a bit loopy? I mean, I know you did a little bit, as you were saying, in your book. And... Yeah, sometimes you can just go loopy. Um, mm. But it, it's quite a tricky thing to manage yourself and the boat, mm. sort of physically, mentally, emotionally, sort of everything, That's logistically, mm. by yourself for mm. a long period of time, under challenging circumstances too. So I guess there's a number of things, really. Um, one is trying to keep perspective about the day. I'd do this thing called Good Things About the Day. Mm, the gratitude I'd... again. Yeah, totally, and just um, making sure that I was trying to reframe stuff. So even if I had a crap day, it might be, thank goodness today's over, or yeah. I'm alive, or the boat's okay. Yeah. Um, I'd have treats from home, little letters from home. I would talk to myself, sing to myself, what did talk you sing? to animals. What did, you sing? what did I sing? I'm pretty good at, uh, you know, full rendition of The Lion King. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but all sorts. I'd recite poems to myself, and I'd learn them, and then, you know, recall them in times of Needing, I think you should row um, a couple of strokes on your side. There we go. Hello, geese. 
I think sort of mindfulness has always been important to me, even before I knew what mindfulness was. And what that is makes it sense. to you? Yeah, what is mindfulness to it's you? It's about being present, I think. Mm. Trying to be aware of your body and what you're feeling, the sensations, and, and trying not to judge them. Mm. Um, so that's not always an easy thing to aim. You know, that's not always an easy thing to attain, but the intention is, is there and, you know, bit by bit, so long as you can do it from time to time, I think that's really, that's really good. And likewise with, you know, meditation, being in the moment, and I guess affirmations too, you know, just mantras, repeating things out, that's handy. It's back to that thing of mental health again, isn't it? It's, it's, it keeps coming up. It's like, it's kind of, um, if we can manage our mental and emotional well-being, then a lot of our life is a lot more manageable. It's about get, so. getting here and here, getting that sorted. Yeah, it I seems think so. To be. Manageable and hopefully sort of enjoyable as well, because you're, you know, you're going to be more present and able to deal with the, the knocks, and, and therefore you're going to be more open to the, the joyous stuff and the, yeah. the good stuff. Roll, roll, roll your boat <laughs> down the stream. I've heard that one a few merrily, times before. Merrily, merrily, <laughs> merrily, life is but a dream. You have been away quite a lot with your adventures. Um, what does home mean to you? <laughs> that is a really interesting question. Oh, good. I was having this chat with someone just the other day. When I was out on my journey, home would be um, both the place that I was with my bike or my boat, you know, and that would be home and it would be this very small world, but equally home would be this other concept, back home yes. as well, and, and somewhere I you know, didn't plan to go to, but I ended up up going there and, and since meeting Lucy in 2013 home has has really become that line from Edward Sharp and the magnetic zeros home is whenever I'm with you you know that's probably the place where I feel most at home wherever we are oh, is nice. uh, is is us being together mm. um, and I hope yeah I hope it kind of always is that really I think I really like that concept that because um, I suppose I've never felt particularly rooted anywhere mm. and that now I feel like we're, we are the roots, we are our roots, and that they can survive and flourish anywhere. Home is something inside of, of you, yeah. and, and that's got to be your ultimate sort of sanctuary, really, yeah. is, is within. For a, a lot of people, sexuality and discovering our sexuality is quite a, um, a big thing, so when did you acknowledge or realise or recognise your um, sexuality of being gay? Well, I was quite a late developer, not until I was 17. Previously, I thought I was straight. Uh -huh. um, that's probably the, the religious pressure, just suppressed subconsciously any acknowledgement of my own inner same-sex desires. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't until I was 17, um, and I remember when I first had sex with a man, thinking to myself, wow, this is amazing, this is wonderful. This feels so natural and so normal. So I never really had a problem. No angst, no you know, tortured self-doubt or whatever. Despite this incredibly strong religious upbringing, which, which saw homosexuality as being you know, one of the worst possible sins on a par with murder and rape. The proof of the pudding was in the eating, <laughs> so to speak. Um, I just felt totally at ease with it. And I thought, well, the Bible must be wrong. Mm, mm. It's, if, if, if it's been con between consenting adults, no one is harmed, no one's complained, people are fulfilled and happy like I am, how can it be wrong? And that was, of course, one of the factors that did help initiate my eventual drift away from religion. In fact, I, I couldn't square the biblical admonishments against homosexuality, given my own experience that it was incredibly um, empowering, fulfilling, sharing experience with someone who I ultimately fell in love with and we are still best friends to this day. Oh, that's nice to know. The appalling tax you've had, Peter, like 300 times you've been attacked and going to Russia, you know, Mugabe and <clears throat> all that kind of stuff. And the physical things that, that have happened to you, like with your coordination and memory and all those, awful, and not being able to eat properly because of that. So I want to know, because you were talking about being 
initially when you were 17, af afraid. How do you keep on going with, with after such um, vicious attacks and abuse? How, how do you get up and go, right, I'm still going to stand up for what is right. I'm still going to make a stand for love. I'm still going to get out there and push myself forward. What, what, how do you do it, man? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a good question I often ask myself. Um, I guess, it, well, again, it's back to the old thing of putting myself in someone else's situation. If I was suffering, I'd want someone to step up to the mark and help me. Yes. So when I see others suffering, and particularly when they're asking actively for help, yeah. I feel it's my duty with others yeah. to do what we can to help them. Yeah, yeah. So that's what drives me on. I also think, you know, at the end of the day, compared to human rights defenders in Russia, Iran, Uganda, I've got off very lightly. Many of them end up being killed or maimed, imprisoned and tortured. So, you know, in that sort so of sense... So you count the blessings in a way yeah. to, to give you the strength and inspiration. I, I put it in perspective. Okay. And when you put it into perspective like that, it makes it easier to deal with. <clears throat> yeah. You know, there have been times when I thought I might be killed. Yes. I mean, in the 80s and 90s when I was sort of demonised as public enemy number one and I was the sort of magnet for all the homophobes and racists um, in the country, yeah. you know, I had, you know, over 50 attacks upon my flat, including about, you know, dozens of bricks and bottles through the windows, a bullet through the door, three arson attempts. Um, I've been physically beaten up on the street over 300 times. This is, we're talking about over four decades. Uh, you know, all my teeth and my mouth are chipped and cracked from the damage that's been caused. So it's, it's been quite tough. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm alive, you yeah. know. I haven't got any really major disabilities. I've got some minor ones with yeah. the brain injury and the eye injury from the various bashings. But I can live with it. I can cope. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Oh, cheers. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. With your, with your performance, with your, your work and your art, do you ha is there some sort of specific um, feeling or emotion that you want to elicit from the participants? Do you, do you go in thinking, okay, with this work, I want them to feel this or have that reaction? Or is, um, it, is it a bit more fluid than that? I think it depends on the work. I always am aiming for them to feel something, obviously. Yeah. And a lot of the time I'm looking for to change a passive audience into an active audience. Oh, that's nice. So whether that means that they passively were going to watch me and now they're actively feeling something. A lot of the time, at the moment, I'm looking for active action. So how can my performance link to them also going home and researching about trans issues? Or how can my performance also equal them texting one of their trans friends to check if they're okay? Oh. Or how can one of my performances mean that next time they're going to ask how one of their friends are going home at night? So I think, for me, I'm looking for how a performance can be the stem of a conversation with a friendship or oh, a group okay. of people. Someone came up to me and said, I wish you'd make more of an effort. <laughs> they were a stranger. And I went, what? I'm like, you know, if you're going to do this, why don't you just try and look like a woman. Yeah. And I was like, thank your pardon. Yeah. Like, I said to her, I was like, who the fuck do you think you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I was like, I don't want to look like a woman. Yeah. And they were like, oh. And I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a woman. Yeah. And I think that's their confusion is they yeah. like think I'm Because again, they can put you in a box, aren't they? Right, and other trans girls yeah. do it to me too, you know. They're like, yeah, they're like, Travis, why don't you talk or why don't you... I was like, I'm not trying to look. What's our obsession? I think that's where our trans politics is, is that we think that trans people are more successful. Our oh, good transition, look how well they look so as a the, woman. Is it the stealth thing? Yeah, I think there's a pressure to look. There's a pressure to fit and look like a gender. And what I'm saying is it's like, no, I've got my stubble and I do bad makeup. And you can tell I was a you can tell I've got a penis. <laughs> and what I'm actually stressing is that I want a gender politics that doesn't care about that. Like, and I think so many more people would be trans if that was if we had a world. I genuinely think trans is a majority. 
I've only started saying this boldly now. I genuinely think there's more people in the world that are trans. But I think what's happening is a world doesn't let us be trans. And I think actually what would happen if it's if we had a world that encouraged gender diversity, encouraged gender variance, all these people would start coming out in dresses. Yeah. You know, the amount of straight men that I met at Latitude Festival when I was hosting the queer club that were like, can I try? I had a dress up box in the middle yeah. of the room. Yeah. All these straight men with their wives were like reaching for it, wanting yeah. to try it out. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you've all wanted to do it. So how do you replenish your soul? For my friends, yeah. my friends. Doing really normal things. I think reminding myself that trans people and trans family people are still really funny, can yeah. still go out and dance, can still have a drink, yeah. can still go eat food. You know, I think there's limitations on it. I was talking about this with someone, I think there's limitations on that. I was talking about actually dating whilst yeah. trans. What happens when the person you're dating experiences harassment for the first time as a byproduct of being with you? Yeah, yeah. That you can't really go out on this like fun first date in public yeah. because they're gonna experience harassment. Yeah. But I think it's reminding ourselves that like, that's why I love trans comedians. Trans comedians are so funny. Like Sean Faye is hilarious. And I love Sean, you know, I also grew up with Sean in Bristol, but apart from that, like I love Sean because she reminds us that trans people have a fucking sense of humor. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it can all get really like, oh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. And it's like, actually, like we're funny as fuck. And so we can make laughs. And, and actually go, humor can be a really strong oh, weapon, can't God, it? God, we're not laughing enough. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> and people have started noticing that in more of my shows now. So I've gotten a lot more confident to stop and have a little chin work. Yeah. And people are like, oh, Travis, you actually make a couple jokes. I was yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> that reminds me, that replenishes my like soul. Oh. It's like, oh, you know what? Like, yes, all this is going going off, but we're also still fucking funny. Yeah. I've met very few people, I have met those people, but very few people that genuinely, their sole purpose was, was to hurt and harm yes. other human beings. Yeah. Um, I have met those people, they yeah. do exist, yeah, they and they do. do need to be held to account. But majority of the people, even who are doing quite egregious things, have a view, a conception of they're doing it for the best possible, you know, reason. There is some even warped logic behind what they're doing. You know, and for me, it's always about trying to get that chink in the armour mm. and probe in there and, and insert some doubt into their, you know, worldview so that you can bring them round and actually have them see, no, you do not need to perpetrate this upon another person. You do, this is not the way to achieve yeah. what you're out to achieve. You know, I have the same goal as you do. Yes, freedom, more love, more joy, you know, a, a safer, happier world. Yeah. You know, that's what, what we're essentially agreeing on. You can often agree at least on that with most people. <laughs> you know, and then you go, well, is the best way to achieve it an illegal occupation? Is the best way to achieve it lying to millions of people is the best way to achieve it, being prejudiced against someone because of the way they look, the colour of their skin, their a country of origin or Selling their sexual arms. orientation or gender. Really, does that bring us together or does it push us apart? And I think if you can really engage with people and they know that you're not doing this to take them down or win or, or defeat them as a human being, yeah. you're doing it because you're engaging with them as a person, as yeah. a curious observer, yeah. I think, A, you get honesty from people yeah. in that context but b you create a relationship and at the end of the day we all need to cohabitate on this planet you know this is our home this but is our shared home yes but that's that's your belief you want to cohabitate there are people that don't want to cohabitate yeah. they think the world belongs to them specifically don't they yeah and that can it just can happen you know it's <laughs> unfortunately for them you know that's it's just, a, you know, that's, that's not the way the world is. You know, we can continue to wish to build ivory towers for ourselves and fortresses with guns at the turrets. Yeah. Um, but you're still going to have to share the planet with everyone else. So where do you get your sense of um, uh, positivity and enthusiasm from? Is that innate in you? Is that something you got from your parents? Or, or where does that come from? I think it's like a cumulative effect of things. Like, mm. I'm, I'm really lucky to have kind of two parents who are like completely loving and completely encouraging. And like, you know, as long as I can remember, they were kind of always saying to me, you know, you're here to do great things, you know? And the dreams that you have are gonna be realized. You are capable 
of fulfilling on what you want to do in so your life. So in a way, that's back to what you were saying earlier about kind of that love and support right from the beginning. That everybody, if everybody had that, had that, yeah. the world would be a better place. It makes such a massive difference because I didn't, I didn't have to learn that I was capable. I, I started off, that was my default mode, was Wonderful. that, oh, well, of course, well, if they've told me that, it must, be, it must be true. You know, why would they lie? Um, and I think having that confidence has really helped me, even at times where sort of my personal confidence might have let me down and I've taken a wrong turn here and, you know, sort of one step forward, two te steps back even a little bit at, at times. Yeah. Um, but even in those moments, there was that kind of voice from them, literally in my head, but also them in person, yeah. um, you know, saying, you know, just figure out your place. You know, they were always very much about, you know, just find your place in the world. The most important thing is to find the thing that inspires you. Yeah. Um, find the thing that is your dream and just go and like make it live in the world. <laughs> I love the sea. It's so, there's something really cathartic to me about the sea. Yeah. Saying to someone the other day, it's kind of, you look at it for, just stand there and look out for 10 minutes. Yeah. It's about the equivalent of a day off. Yeah, it is, <laughs> Just... it is. The statistic now from the Natsal survey in the UK is that around half of people see themselves as having some kind of sexual dysfunction. So we're talking a lot of people who are very unhappy around sex, and my belief is that a lot of that is to do with us having this very narrow definition of what counts as sex. So everyone's trying to have penis and vagina intercourse leading to an orgasm. They're really scared about admitting to any kind of problems with sex or any kind of fetishes or kinks. But we also know about two thirds of people have some kind of kinky fantasies. They're just not letting them go because they're worried about You could about say it. Like, the vampire yeah. stuff is a kinky fantasy. Yeah, or like um, Fifty Shades of Grey. Like, think how, yeah. how many people bought that book and watched that movie, yeah, yeah. you know, suggesting some degree of kinky that, interest. Is you that know? like you do a vlog, a blog? A blog, a yeah. Blog, and you did a, a small section on... Um, <laughs> That's um, right. Dominant and submissive relationships. And it was the most... Um, I, I still get 200 hits a day on that post. Hits yeah, a day. like people mostly come to my blog who are looking for help with how to have dominant submissive relationships so it's it's a really common kind of um, that people like to mix a bit of power in with their sex and a but lot of people find that hot but yeah yeah but isn't the whole of life about dominance and submission yeah we submit to a government we submit to the police we submit yeah. to kind of rules or, or we or we take charge and, and this in is control. part I mean it may be partly a wider appeal because then you know that those kind of things can be so oppressive in our wider lives you know the way that workplaces kind of treat us and yeah. objectify us or yeah. the, the way we've been bullied in the past, that kind of thing. And actually, I think for a lot of people, kink can be about reclaiming some of that mm. or taking, you know, if you're very dominant in your wider life, you can get to be submissive in kink. There's all kind of ways that it's quite helpful for people, I think, to play with some of that stuff. So does that fit in with your, your theory about embracing uncertainty? Because for a lot of people, yeah. embracing uncertainty, I think Urquhart Tolley talks about yeah. surrendering to the uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. And that, to some people, myself included, can be a, a, a scary concept because yeah. you're literally going into the unknown. It's really frightening, I think. Um, yeah, for a lot of people, uncertainty is the is a really terrifying thing to go into. And I suppose that's it. You're about, with sex or relationships, it's about maybe letting go of those rules you've been holding on to about what counts as proper sex or what's a good relationship and finding out for yourself which is uncertain terrain. Yeah. I think it can lead to greater sense of fulfilment. Yeah. You know, I, I think that the more open we are to our vulnerabilities, yeah. kind of the better for us being rounded human beings. Yeah, yeah. That's that's my belief, but we definitely get into uncharted waters there. It's not the kind of thing we've got psychological studies on necessarily to to, to hold on to. It's it's more of a, a matter of faith really, a leap of faith. A leap of faith. Yeah. And in a way that would actually kind of advance humanity as a whole, wouldn't it? I think so. I think so. Because, because it's going into uncharted territory. We need a bit of that right now. You know, I, I think with so much clinging on to the rules and onto hierarchies of, you know, which people are more important and less important, valuing, you know, again, in the wider world, we value people very differently on the grounds of gender, disability, class. You know, I think for me, the way forward is to a more compassionate society where we value everybody equally. And the question is, how do we get from here to there?
If I had one day in heaven, the people I'd like to see are those I'd like to remember, the heroes of LGBT. I'd like to speak with Harvey Milk, tell him he's great and fine, cause he stood up for all our rights, yours, ours and mine. I'd fall in love with Marlena Dietrich, always wanted to. What am I to do? I can't help it. I'd be daring and foppish with Oscar Wilde, amused by his dazzling wit, discuss poetry, plays and life with him and ask, was Bosie worth it? I'd enjoy being Sappho's muse, perusing those Grecian views, serenaded by the sweetest sounds in a place where lesbians abound. I'd like to walk with Gertrude Stein and talk about cow, 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 stroke her poodle known as basket, and let her show me how, how, how. I'd walk in Derek Jarman's garden, discussing film, art, flowers. Let our imagination bloom as we while away the hours. So you see, today's the day to honour our ghosts of the past. Let's not forget what they mean to us. Let our one day in heaven last. So just a, a few quick fire questions just for, so it's an either or, so just a quick like, I'll give you a, a question you start first. <laughs> so, Derek Jarman or Gus Van Sant? Ah, <laughs> Gus Van Sant. <laughs> Land or sea? Sea. <laughs> Bikes or boats? Ooh, boats. <laughs> Favourite historical figure? I was always obsessed with, like, female Greek goddesses. Mm. I love Athena. I think she's badass. Mm. Uh, if I was to share one beauty tip, what would it be? <laughs> Spiky hair rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Main West or Marilyn Monroe? Oh, God, uh, Marilyn. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Any reason why? Uh, you see, now you're, you're asking me binary questions. Oh, and I'm you're, a non -binary right. Person. you're right. You're right. I should have said both because that would be the accurate answer. Okay. Okay. <laughs> or neither. Charles Dickens or Armstead Morpin? Ah. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> to be young and fit, or old and wise? Old and wise? Because then you've had the young and fit, haven't you? Yeah. Good one. Fashion designer. My favourite fashion designer, if there is one. I love Vivian Westwood. What she did for fashion and boldness was incredible. Yeah. Your favourite singer is? Alanis Morissette. Uh, Meryl Streep or... Um... Oh, God, I can't think of her other name. Meryl Streep. <laughs> <laughs> Freud or Young? Young, for sure. Yeah. The shadow, I love it. Yeah. OK. Theatre or film? <sighs> oh! Antique or brand new? Antique. No, I love both, yeah, yeah. but film travels. Anyone can see it, it's there forever, yeah. so I can get it to some, uh, some kids who can, can click on this film and they can live in a farmhouse in the middle of Nebraska and, oh my God, I'm not alone. Oh, yeah. And they, they have to get there, but of course being in the room, oh, what an excitement. Yeah. So film. Film. Favourite artist? Oh, that's too hard. OK. Um, one, my favourite artist right now, I like Fade Men On. Um, they're an incredible writer, trans theatre maker that's just cutting edge. Okay. Apples or oranges? Oranges. <laughs> are they the only fruit? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, all these okay. are under protest. Yeah. You're being very <laughs> sly with me. You're making me look bad. Custard creams or bourbons? Neither. <laughs> not Too binary. So much, not so much into biscuits. No. Okay. I go cake instead. Okay. <laughs> lemon, lemon drizzle or chocolate cake? Lemon then. drizzle. <laughs> <laughs> what the world needs now is more. Love. Is peace. 
It's more sets of ears that are actively listening. Compassion, kindness. Honesty. Honesty. Honesty and acceptance. There's nothing to fear in honesty, and there's nothing to fear in the truth. What's your motto? Is it motto for life? Is that the right way of phrasing it? Do you have a motto? I have a whole series. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, love is the beginning, the middle, and the end of any true liberation struggle. Yep. Don't accept the world as it is. Dream of what the world could be, and then help make it happen. Oh, I love that. That is brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. That's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> no worries. Thank you for coming out to play. Oh, thank you for coming out to play. <laughs> oh, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> that was all right. I was like really like, I thought it was going to be like hot sauce or mayo. And I was like, ah! Well, hot sauce or mayo? Hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, that was fun. Great. That was so fun. Thanks, mate. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for including me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh. Oh, thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Oh, thank that was you, the best interview ever. Ever. Oh, thank you.